Anafuna is the 10th highest mountain in the world at 8091 meters above sea level. It's one of the deadliest mountains on the planet and is well known for the difficulty and dangers involved in its ascent. Anafuna poses grave threats to climbers through avalanche danger, unpredictable weather and extremely steep nature of its climbing routes. The south face of Anafurna is renowned as one of the most typical climbs in the world. In 1950, two French climbers, Maurice Herzog and Louis Lachinal, reached the summit of Anafurna via the north face, making it the first 8,000 meter peak ever successfully climbed. Anafurna is the only 8,000 meter peak to be conquered on the first try. Maurice Herzog and Louis Lachinal climb it without bottle oxygen. However, the feat came with a high price. Since they wore only thin leather boots up to the summit, the expedition's doctor had to amputate all of Herzog and Lachinal's tools after extreme frostbite and then gangrene set in during the descent. Hazog lost all of his finger as well. The first winter ascent of Anafurna where the north face was made by Polish climbers Jorzeg Kuczka and Artur Heiser. They reached the summit on the 3rd of February 1987. It was Kukochka's 13 8,000-meter mountain. A Japanese team from the Gama Prefecture Mountaineering Federation attempted the south base of Anafurna in the winter of 1984-1985, only to turn back after reaching 7,200 meters. However, they resolved to make another attempt on the south base in the near future. In November 1987, a 14-member strong Japanese expedition arrived at the base camp of Anafurna under the leadership of Kuniaki Agahara. They aimed to make the post-winter ascent of the formidable south base of Anafurna. The Japanese formulated force assault tactics designed to keep them from getting caught in bad weather for a long time. It was planned to restrict the assault period to only 15 days. Longer periods were difficult both physically and mentally, requiring them to rest long periods in dangerous locations. Considering that the bad weather and snowfall of late December would be their major problems, they felt a forced assault was their only choice. They felt that the ability and experience were sufficient to do the climb in that time. If they could solve the problem of high altitude acclimatization. Another element of their strategy was to move base camp close to the south base and reduce the number of camps. The camps would have to be able to withstand long periods of snowfall. They flanked their Camp 5 at the site of the British Camp 7 above the mini rock band. In the event, Camp 4 at 7,400 meters was their highest. In a normal year, weather conditions are more stable for about one month from early November through to early December. Therefore, they had been keeping in mind the fact that climbing in the early part of December might not be recognized as an authorized record if the definition of winter in the Himalaya was strictly adhered to. Climbing in January and February seemed too risky and typical at that stage. Therefore, they understood that making the climb in December was an intermediate step toward the next challenge in midwinter. Although they planned in a sole period of only 15 days, they adopted a cautious approach and took enough food to last them until the middle of February, which would take care of any unforeseen circumstances. 
They saw snowfall as the only thing that could prolong their climb. Apart from the snowfall, no other weather hazard was foreseen which might delay their progress while climbing. On the south face of Annapurna, the effects of cold and strong wind are not as severe as in some other places. They also carried double quantities of gear such as rope etc. in case they had to reopen and prepare the climbing route again where fax ropes had been buried under snow. The growing Himalayan experience and accomplishments of the Japanese were far superior to those of the 1970 British expedition led by Chris Bennington. Bennington's team climbed this route in spring when much more snow falls, although the cold is not quite as severe as in winter. The 1970 British expedition had only three members with Himalayan experience, with a total of six climbs among them. The Japanese had eight members who had climbed 8,000 meter summits a total of 17 times. After the first pale attempt on the south base of Annapurna by Japanese, Bulgarian and Swiss expedition tried the route in winter, but they also failed. The Japanese set up base camp on the 22nd of November at 4,300 meters at the base of the south face. They took acclimatization trips, totaling 10 days, to tent peak at 5,663 meters and in the direction of Glacier Doom. Ten peak was climbed a total of 27 times by 11 members. They hoped to climb to 7,000 meter level on Glacier Doom but reached only 6,000 meters to return to base game. They then took four days for rest and preparations. On the 1st of December, the real climbing started. After checking the road before the end of November, they climbed an ice fall they didn't need to have a road foot up it and fetched came one above its top at 5,300 meters. The next day, Yamada, Saito and Kobayashi began to put the road up to camp 2. On the 3rd of December, ferrying of loads started in the rear of the route. Camp 2 was pitched at 6,100 meters. Progress was very fast. However, that very afternoon, a hanging glacier on the south base collapsed and hit Camp 1 directly. Though Camp 1 was not in the direct path of the avalanche, it still suffered a direct hit. Six tents and almost all of the already stuck gear and foodstuffs, comprising 90% of the total quantity required for setting up higher camps, were swept away. There were 10 climbers and shorefalls in the tent at the time. Fortunately, they took shelter beneath an ice ledge and had a narrow escape except for one sherpa who suffered injuries to his head and shoulder which was struck by block of ice. However, they were able to resume activities using spare gear and foodstuffs deposited at the base camp. By the 6th of December, the route was put through up to the site of Camp 3 at 6,850 meters. However, because of the long period of good weather on the south base, a shower of rocks ran down continuously. The next day, one of the teams engaged in route selection took a direct hit from a rock the size of a man's head, which hit him in the foot. Although his injury was not serious, he was transferred to lower camp to get better. They rescheduled the fishing up camp 3 for December 10. By that time, the weather was turning worse. On the 11th of December, snow began to fall. It fell all day. One meter accumulated at Camp 2. Having had a series of accidents and unfavorable weather conditions such as the avalanche, injury by falling rocks, a sharp first fall into a crevasse and the snowfall, they were depressed recollecting the failure three years before. 
All activities were stopped on the 13th of December as there was a danger of avalanche. A Canadian team that was trying to climb the south base by a new route decided to call off in the face of heavy snowfall and avalanche dangers. They reached 6,100 meters. Route preparation began again on the 14th of December. The newly fallen snow held loose rocks and flares, reducing the amount of falling rock. They proceeded beyond the highest point, which was reached by the previous expedition and arrived at the foot of the right-hand side of the plate iron. The name given to the rock base up about 100 meter high, which was the crux of the whole route. The pace was partly overhanging. Nazuka negotiated this difficult raw face and after intense efforts over a period of more than four hours, succeeded. On the 17th of December, Nazuka, Saigosa and Kobayashi worked on the route preparation while Yano, accompanied by one Sherpa carrying gear and foodstuffs, set up camp 4 at 7,400 meters on the same day. Camp 4 was on a snowy ridge, since the soft layer of snow was so thin that digging revealed hard ice just below the surface, one third of the tent was without foundations. At night, the three members of the team huddled together and didn't get into their sleeping bags. In the next two days, ropes were fixed along the Kulua from Camp 4 to Mini Rock Bend at 7,700 meters and it was decided that the summit assault would be carried out by two teams of six to seven members each. At 3.40 a.m. on the 20th of December, four climbers, Noboru Yamada, Yasuhira Saito, Tiro Sayogosa, and Toshiyuki Kobayashi left Camp 4 for the summit. It was still dark and the temperature was about minus 35 degrees Celsius. The weather was very fine with no wind. At 9 a.m. they reached the mini rock band. They climb a snow face and a snow ridge leading to the summit rock face. At midday, they started to ascend the rock face. All the actions of the summit or soul team were being watched from the base camp by binoculars. They climbed the rock face in two hours and reached the summit ridge. The north face of the Furna was not hit by sunlight and it was quite cold although there was only a light breeze. At 3.17 pm, they finally reached the summit of Anafurna after 12 hours of top climbing from Camp 4. It was the first successful ascent of the south base of Anafurna in winter. They made a video of the scenic views from the summit with a video camera. They transmitted several words to express their delight and gratitude to base camp from the summit. And the base camp responded expressing sincere thanks and appreciations for the success of the team. At 3.48 pm, Yamada and Saito left the summit and started their descent. Saigosa and Kobayashi had gone ahead. Saigosa had no headlamps, so he descended early. An hour later, as the climbers finished descending the steep summit rock face, just as they started down a relatively gradual slope, Kobayashi fell at 7,900 meters. Yamada said that Kobayashi had probably fallen through stumbling over a cornice. Yamada and Saito watched as Kobayashi fell. But on the steep south pass, there was no hope that he would stop or be saved. It was all over quickly, and they had no choice but to resign themselves to his fate. At 5.30 pm, as the south pass was red with alfin glow, Yamada inside to reach the end of the fax roof. 
of returning to Camp 4 a little earlier than 7 p.m., Yamada said that Saito was also coming down a little behind. Someone at Camp 4 made a call to Saito, to which they heard a response. Saigo Samenta would to meet him and exchange a few words with him. But just before Saito reached camp, he suddenly yelled and disappeared. As Saito scrambled on touched the rocks while falling, sparks were thrown off and faded into the depths of darkness. He fell just 20 meters above Camp 4 at 7,400 meters. Kobayashi and Saito's poles were apparently caused by fatigue. Their delight in their success was short-lived. The worst had befallen them. Kobayashi and Saito were killed in falls, one after the other. The difference between joy and sorrow was just too great and left them speechless. They were devastated. They decided to abort the second summit bed plan for the 22nd of December and withdraw. Yamada and Yagihara went down ahead of the others. On the 22nd of December, all members returned and gathered at the base camp. A helicopter search a week later was in vain and neither the worries nor any of the equipment were found. The Japanese successfully climbed a difficult route on an 8,000 meter peak for the first time in winter, the south base of Fanafuruna, without using supplemental oxygen. Until the accident took place, they believed that they could succeed in their climb, exactly as they had planned and aimed beforehand. However, afford from the fact that their original plan to complete the ascent in 15 days was not fulfilled and despite the achievement of reaching the summit, the outcome was not satisfactory due to the fact that they had lost two of those who had successfully reached the summit. Kobayashi was the student of Gama University. He had joined the Everest expedition and reached the South Coal twice when he was 19. After that, he showed remarkable progress in mountaineering. And he was only 22 years old when he died. Saito had climbed Manaslu and Venta in Alpine style together with Yamada. Saito had the honor of making the first ascent of the Pier Route on Dalugeri 1 in 1982. Thank you all so much for watching.